I had uh, probably done about 40,000 miles or so of sailing. I'd been back and forth to Bermuda, I don't know, at least a half dozen times or so. I mean, been across the Atlantic once and, and so on. So I was m what I consider moderately experienced as a sailor. Steve told his family and friends that his trip should take about a month, but that if conditions were against him, it could take much longer. Within a week, he was wishing he could have been more precise. The initial moments were um, a lot of things happening at once, a tremendous explosion, um, and water came thundering in, like a, like a river flowing into the boat. I'm pretty sure it was something that T-boned the boat um, my presumption is it was a whale, but I'll never know for sure. The water was coming in very, very fast, and there was no question in my mind I had to get out of the boat. I knew that I really needed my ditch kit, so um, I took the chance of diving down and feeling around getting that. On board his raft, Steve had made some really good preparations. He had paddles, with which he could obviously move it and ward off sharks. He had flares. He had a signal mirror, six pints of tinned water, some fishing kit, navigation equipment. That was going to prove vitally important. And he had a couple of these, solar stills, with which he could turn salt water into fresh drinking water. In his ditch kit, Steve had a few other useful emergency items. He kept a Tupperware box in which he had 21 more emergency flares. He had some emergency food. He had a knife, some pencils, two more pints of water. And most crucially of all, he had this, a spear gun. Although he was better prepared than many who found themselves in similar situations, Steve was initially pessimistic about his chances. I was just about smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there was certainly a big part of me that said, forget it, you're not even going to get out of here. I realized that in the area I was, I was in, I would be pushed by the currents and the trade winds towards the West Indies. Unfortunately, I figured it would take me about two and a half, three months in order to, to reach that land. And I didn't really think that I could live that long. But this book proved to be crucial. It's a manual to sea survival that contains just about everything you need to know to live from the sea. It was compiled by Dougal Robertson, who spent 38 days adrift with his family in 1972. Fortunately, Stephen included one of these in his ditch kit. It provided me both with um, concrete information and also a reminder of his own tale. Knowing that people somehow were able to create a life for themselves, um, even in the middle of this sort of uh, what, I, what I often call the watery uh, desert of the world, the ocean, um, gave me a great inspiration. The basic theory is that uh, you can live about 10 days without water and you can live a month without food. So uh, water is the definite priority. I had about eight pints of water in my ditch kit. So I figured, well, maybe I've got 18 days to live, which wasn't even enough time to get me to the shipping lanes, the nearest shipping lanes. I looked out in the ocean and it was it was beautiful. It was like a, you know a swimming pool, three miles deep, just gorgeous water. But it's the old uh, ancient mariner thing thing of you know water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. The reason you can't drink seawater is that if you do, the amount of salt in your body increases, which means you have to take water from your vital organs to dilute it. In other words, you dehydrate and die more quickly than if you drank no water at all. Dehydration is just a horrible, horrible thing. 
it was important to ration the water and I you know I'm sitting there going okay in another half hour I get to take this other little teeny bit of water in my mouth and it's such a joy when you do and then you wait for the another another hour or two hours so it, it just dominates your entire being but there are a couple of pieces of modern equipment that can help you turn seawater into fresh water. This is a solar still. What we've got here is a ring section that helps it float and a condenser section, both of which need inflating. Through this tube here, you fill the central portion with seawater. And under the action of the sun, that condenses as fresh water here, runs down on the inside of this part and is collected through this little tube here into that bag. This is another handy piece of equipment. It's called a reverse osmosis pump. And what this does is it removes the salt from the seawater. In here, I've got salt water, and this tube Jerry's holding there, well, that's where the fresh water comes out of. And this is how it operates. And you can see, though, that you don't get very much water for quite a lot of pumping. So one tip is to do this pumping in the evening when you sweat less. Otherwise, you may use up more water than you get back from it. But these pumps hadn't been invented 20 years ago. All Steve had with him were solar stills, which were proving unreliable at first. The problem was that the waves would come by and take the solar still out to the end of its tether and snap it, which would fling the salt water into the, the fresh distillate, and I would end up with just salt water rather than fresh. Finding food wasn't a problem. There was no shortage of fish attracted by barnacles growing on the bottom of the raft. But catching them was a different matter. Despite having a spear gun, it took Steve nearly two weeks to break his duck. When I caught the first fish, I just broke down weeping from both uh, uh, horror and joy at the same time. I mean, it really was a... Uh, an important psychological signal that I possibly could uh, live for two and a half, three months, whatever it took in order to reach land. At the same time, it was uh, also a signal that I'd been lowered to uh, the most desperate point in my entire existence. Later that same day, Steve managed to spear a Dorado, a fish that would provide his staple diet for the next nine weeks. The Dorado actually were an incredibly tasty fish to begin with. We pay good money for them in restaurants, and I wrote in my log that it was like being in this uh, dungeon, being thrown a filet mignon every, every few days. The interesting thing to me was that those parts of the fish that uh, normally I would think of as being incredibly disgusting were things that I actually looked forward to eating. They tasted the best to me. I mean, there was nothing better to me than a fresh fish eye, which, you know, young kids love to hear about, you know, eating fresh fish eyes because they think it just sounds so horrible. But for me, they were nuggets of, of almost pure fluid. And so that was a, a, a real kind of revelation that your body almost seems to know what it needs. Catching fish is never easy. It was 13 days before Steve caught any, and he had a spear gun. But even if you don't have a spear gun, there are some things you can do. One of the most obvious is to take a paddle like this and attach something sharp to the end of it to turn it into a spear. I lashed this knife on it earlier, and now I've got a handy harpoon. Alternatively, you can use hooks and line. And if you haven't got fish hooks like these, you can improvise. Morris and Marilyn Bailey caught over 4,000 fish with hooks like that, made from safety pins. And finally, if you can get them, seabirds can be eaten. These are boobies, and they're very easily caught. If you put some bait on the deck with a noose around it, all you have to do is wait for the bird to come down, take the bait, and catch him by his legs. That's the origin of the word booby trap.
after I think after I was in the raft about two weeks or thereabouts, I really was, began looking at myself as a, kind of an aquatic caveman, someone who, uh, if I was inventive and lucky enough, could uh, live for an.